I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and especially for the organization. Uh, I know that with my personal experience that organizing a conference, the efforts which you have to apply, it's an exponential function of the number of participants. So the fact that we're here in this uh, large audience which can fit everybody and that everything goes so smoothly shows that it's, it was a very serious and considerable organization and already having this whole was complicated diplomatic work. So I'm really very grateful to organizers. And <laughs> Not that my, not that, that the first time I met Jean Christophe has bad memories for me, but I prefer to, it's actually excellent memories, but I prefer to tell the other story. It's the story which is borrowed from Erwan Lano, uh, who was a young researcher and among a group of uh, PhD students and postdocs and young researchers, they decided to organize a small school in Brittany and uh, Erwan Lano asked Pascal Hubert to present Erwan to Jean Christophe. It was an occasion in Marseille uh, to ask Jean, Jean Christophe to be a member of organizing committee. And first, Pascal explained that no, no, you don't need a presentation. Just go straight to Jean Christophe. You can do it. Uh, Jean Christophe, speaking to Jean Christophe, doesn't need doesn't need a presentation. So. Erwan took his courage and spoke to Jean Christophe. And the first, the, the answer of Jean Christophe was yes, of course. And the first question was, what would be the amount of people? Erwan replied, well, about 40. The answer of Jean Christophe was, oh, that's a pity. Up to 20, I could just invite to my house in Brittany, and we would do it there. So this is, to my mind, typical for Jean Christophe. And the way that there are so many people who came to this conference shows that how much he was appreciated. And I'm thankful to all participants who make an effort to come here and to commemorate the memory of Jean Christophe. So the, it might be strange that at a dynamical conference I'm speaking about volumes, there are two reasons. Uh, one is that volumes are closely related to square tile surfaces. And Jean Christophe was one of the best experts in the world in square tile surfaces and liked them very much. So this was a very serious reason for me. And another is that these volumes are beyond many very important quantities you have heard about during this conference. For example, uh, Karina and Marcelo were speaking about Lyapunov exponents. Usually, they are impossible to compute. And in this particular story, there is a way to compute some of them, sometimes sums, sometimes particularly up and exponents. And to compute them, you need volumes. Or, for example, uh, there is a wonderful work of Pascal Hubert, Vincent Delacroix, and Samuel Lelievre on, uh, on diffusion rate of billiard, of periodic billiard, where obstacles are rectangles, and they show that the diffusion rate is not one half as, and as in billiard, uh, Sinai billiard, but two thirds. And again, to get this two thirds, you have to know some Lyapunov exponents. And morally, what is beyond is again volume, and so on. So these volumes appear everywhere, uh, in particular in counting closed billiard trajectories, and so on. And also, there is a beautiful interplay between geometry and dynamics in this volume. So this was a mathematical motivation. So when I prepared my talk, I realized that it's too simple and that I might be kicked out of this building, which is very serious. So I decided to make at least one slide, which is somehow serious. All the other ones would be less serious. Don't be, don't be afraid. So the object I want to consider is this Moduli space of pairs where C is a holomorphic, uh, is a complex curve, well, Riemann surface, and this is a holomorphic one form of this surface. And this, exactly the same object is space 
of these translation surfaces which appeared in the talk of Kurt McMullen. So it's two equivalent languages. You pre if you prefer analytic language, you consider this one. If you prefer more geometric language, you consider this uh, translation surfaces glued from polygons. So as you know from beautiful talk of Kurt, we know little about geometry of the space, but locally it is very simple. There is, a, well, there are distinguished coordinates, um, local coordinates in this space, which are called period coordinates, and which are just first cohomology of the surface relative to collection of points where our form has zeros. So the form has exactly n zeros of degrees m1, etc., mn. We take these points as a subset of the surface and we consider relative cohomology with complex coefficients. So this is a vector space. And this is not just a vector space, it's cohomology. Inside this vector space, we have a natural integer lattice. As soon as you have a vector space, you have a natural family of volume elements, which are linear volume elements in the vector space. As soon as you have a lattice in the vector space, you can normalize it because you say the fundamental domain of the lattice has volume one. So we have God-given perfect normalization, so we have a volume element in our space, defined at this local coordinates. And another object is, uh, oh, by the way, uh, in this geometric language, the periods which live here are nothing but sides of the polygons, which are considered, so you can consider a side as a vector in R2, but also you can consider it as a complex number. So these complex numbers are exactly these relative periods. So sides of the polygons are, if you choose a, an appropriate partner, are sort of naturally the coordinates in this space. And also there is a function which is in flat language is defined as just flat area of our translation surface in terms of holomorphic one form. Uh, it is defined by this quadratic expression in absolute periods. So um, this function is homogeneous. And of course, with such volume element, when we have a space which locally resembles a vector space, it's meaningless to speak about volume, but when we have a function like this, we can chop part of our space by this inequality, considering only translation surfaces of area at most one. So we kill a sort of stupid part of non-compactness of our space, and then it becomes meaningful to speak about volume of, of this part. And by definition, the volume of a moduli space like this is integral of our volume element with respect to this subset, subset of smaller values. This is a conventional normalization factor, and the non-trivial theorem says this, this space is still non-compact, and a non-trivial theorem of Mazur and Beach says that the total volume of any stratum uh, is finite. Mm. The normalization factor here is chosen by the following reason. Instead of considering the set of smaller values, you can consider a hypersurface where the area is exactly one. And when you have a volume element in the ambient space and a level, function, level uh, hypersurface of a function, you get induced volume element on the hypersurface. And if you measure the corresponding hyper area of the corresponding hypersurface, this would be exactly the answer. And this is the place where dynamics is hidden. Because when you apply a transformation from SL2R um, to your translation surface, to your polygon, SL2R does not change the flat area, right? So it means that the level hypersurface uh, H1 is preserved. And it is a theorem, another theorem of Mazur and Veitch that this action of SL2R on H1 with this induced surface volume element, su well, surface element is ergodic. Uh, and now, when I prove that there is something serious beyond, let's come to 
through stuff. So how do we learn in school how do we measure area, for example, or volume? Well, you make a square grid and you count the number of squares, right? And then you make a better square grid and you count the number of squares even better and then you normalize. You choose smaller and smaller squares and, and then you normalize. So this is a, sort of my hypersurface, hyperbolo well, equivalent of unit sphere or unit hyper hyperboloid and we want to measure area, well, volume or of some part of it. Now, the same thing can be done in the following way. Just rescale everything so that these tiny squares become unit squares and count the number of unit squares in this larger sector, which is rescaled proportionally. So this level hypersurface is a level hypersurface of a homogeneous function. So basically the problem of counting volume is counting the number of integer points of the lattice where the integer points, integer point represents a surface of area at most n. Uh, now let's recall that our integer points have geometric meanings. They represent flat surfaces. So what distinguishes a flat surface which is an integer point. I claim that this is a torus curve. It is a torus curve by the following reason. So if all periods of your holomorphic one form are integer plus i integer, then you can define a map from your Riemann surface uh, to a torus in the following way. Choose one point for the best one is the distinguished point, one of the zeros. And then if you have any other point, just join the two points by a path. So this point is fixed once and forever. And we want to associate a point of the torus to this one. So we integrate our form along the path. And we take this number mod z plus i z. Uh, it's faster to use hands. I'm much more used to my hands than to the blackboard. And also I have pictures. So uh, this is an example of this square tiled surface. So uh, here, I forgot to say that if you consider your torus in the usual way as a square with two sides, two, two pairs of opposite sides identified, then we get square tiling of our Riemann surface. So now I can reformulate the question even uh, more practically. So you have a simplified Lego game. Your Lego pieces are just squares. You are given one million squares, and the question is how many surfaces, t square tiled surfaces uh, of, for example, like here, of genus two with a single conical singularity with the angle six pi, can you create using at most one million squares? That's the question we're discussing. So this is the answer for, oh, sorry. I forgot to say that it is practical to make separate count. So for this particular square tiled surface, we see that we have two cylinders, two flat cylinders. So this side is identified with this side. So this is a cylinder. And this is a cylinder filled with uh, closed flat geo horizontal closed geodesics of the same length. And we have another cylinder which is also filled with horizontal closed geodesics, which are twice longer in this particular case. And at some point, we will also consider vertical cylinder decomposition. So the next slide is computation of uh, contributions of square tiled surfaces having one, two, three, and four cylinders to this particular stratum in genus three. And as you see, this is a nightmare already in genus three. The only thing which is easy to compute is this contribution of, uh, it, uh, th th that's the relative contributions. The total sum, sum of this um, absolute contribution is the volume, which is in denominator. So the volume itself is something nice. Z2 of six, it's, uh, what's it? Pi power six over, uh, 
900 something. Anyways, pi power 6 times rational number. No, foot, I forgot. Uh, but particular contributions are complicated. The only one which is easy is one cylinder contribution, and this is what I suggest you to, what I ask you to memorize because we will use it later. It is easy to compute one cylinder surfaces. Well, their combinatorics is way easier. All the other ones, it's a disaster. Okay, so this was, the previous slide was my naive attempt to join the pieces because I knew that the answer is nice and I tried to find some structure, I failed completely. The structure was found by Alex Eskin, Andrea Kunkov, and later by, together with Raul Pandari Pande. They did very smart thing, as soon as you count something, wrap it in a generating function. This is a very efficient receipt. So when you count square tile surfaces or anything else, try to wrap the counting in a single generating function. If you wrap it correctly, the generating function would have nice properties. And indeed, if you count square tile surfaces with the, way, with the appropriate weight, which is typical in this kind of problems, which is one over the order of the automorphism group, uh, then the corresponding generating function is wonderful. It's, it's a quasi-model of form. And in this way, they proved that volumes of all strata are really pi power 2g times some rational number. And computation of volume is computation of this rational number. So as really as a number. Uh, so it is not a closed formula. It is rather a computational algorithm, quite efficient. So Alex Eskin implemented this theorem to an algorithm and computed all volumes of all strata up to genus 10, and for some strata up to genus 200. And recently, Dawi Chen, Martin Muller, and Don Zagir, and I will speak about it uh, later, they constructed another generating function, which worked even better, and they were able to, to compute the volume of the principal stratum exactly up to genus 2000 and prove more. Uh, now, there are translation surfaces and half translation surfaces. Half translation surfaces are those which correspond to quadratic differentials. Everything is, in a sense, completely analogous, except that technically much more painful for quadratic differentials. So conceptually, there is basically no difference. Uh, instead of square tile surfaces, you count so-called pillowcase covers. So that's the covers over a sphere, which is glued from two squares. So you are counting, again, you are given one million pieces and you are counting uh, this kind of pillowcase covers like this and you want to know how many animals you can get. So this is one of them. This is, as you see, this is genus uh, zero. This is a sphere, a uh, square tile sphere. Now, the case of genus zero is somehow exceptional, as always. In genus zero, it is possible to give a compact formula in the following way. This formula was conjectured by Maxim Kansevich, and the formula is as follows. First, let me define a function which is defined on integer numbers uh, starting from minus one, minus one, zero, one, and so on. Double factorial is product of all even or all odd numbers up to n or n plus one. Then you multiply by power of pi and then by this correctional factor. So you define this function for minus one and zero by hands. And this is the formula. So if you have a stratum of quadratic differentials in genus zero and d1, etc., dk tell you the degrees of your zeros and simple poles, then you just take the product of this function v over all entries d, apply this universal constant, and you get the volume. So the reason why I'm telling you not only because I'm proud with this theorem, but be because we'll use it in a very short time. So volume in genus zero is something which is given by a very simple formula. 
And the reason, well, one of the reasons why I'm so happy with this, this theorem is that actually this is a problem from, in a sense, from algebraic geometry. We are computing some asymptotics for some very special Hurwitz numbers. We are counting the number of covers over a sphere, and it is supposed to be a domain of algebraic geometry. So we, and, combin and combinatorics, we tried for approximately 15 years to uh, prove this formula. So, no, no, not 15 years, but we, we tried to, to work in this direction for many years um, using this kind of methods, and we failed completely, and their approach which worked uses dynamics. Actually, the base of all this story is a formula for Lyapunov exponents, which is particular, which sort of degenerates on genus zero, and gives some recurrence relations between volumes. And these recurrence relations, which have dynamical origin in the proof, enable to prove this theorem. That's why initially this idea seemed to me completely artificial and somehow crazy, but it was the only one which worked finally. Okay, now I hope that I convinced you that it's quite painful usually to compute volumes. And now let me show you how one can compute volumes experimentally. And again, using dynamics. So we agreed that counting volumes is counting tiny squares in some domain. And we can, and also I showed you that one can separate uh, integer points. So we can sort of attribute sort of colors to integer points because we have integer points which represent one cylinder surfaces, two cylinder surfaces, etc., up to 2G plus number of zeros minus one. So we have finite number of colors which I attribute to each number of cylinders a color and we can compute uh, points of different colors separately. And the claim is that asymptotic contribution of points of each color does not depend on the domain. So you, when you fix your domain and you make your grid smaller and smaller and then you look what is asymptotic proportion of red points, blue points and so on, it's the same for, for any domain. Okay, so there, so in my notation, C1 is contribution of one cylinder surfaces, C2, two cylinder surfaces, and so on. So if I compute contribution of square tile surfaces with all number of cylinders, I get the volume. And PK is sort of probability to see a K cylinder surfaces. Contribution of K cylinder surfaces normalized by the volume. Now, up to now, I considered only horizontal distribution of cylinders, but we can also consider vertical distribution of cylinders. So CKJ is K horizontal cylinders and J vertical ones. And the second theorem says that there is no correlation between statistics of the number of horizontal and vertical maximal cylinders. So this formula is sort of a formula that conditional probability is the same as absolute probability. You can, in this sort of vague interpretation, this is the probability to take by random a square tile surface and realize that it has K cylinders. And now I tell you, and suppose that your surface has J vertical cylinders. We already know it. We consider only surfaces with J vertical cylinders and we take a surface with J vertical cylinders by random. What is a probability that it would have K horizontal cylinders. The formula claims that the probability wouldn't change. This extra information about vertical distribution doesn't give you extra, uh, doesn't make any correlation. Uh, this is an asymptotic formula, so this is not an exact count. And again, I feel somehow proud of being able to use dynamical tools because what is beyond the top theorem and, and the, the second one is a more regularity theorem. So it's 
sort of a Ratner theorem in a simplified context. And this does not give, that you cannot apply it to exact count for fixed number of, of squares, but asymptotically it gives these results. And I'm not sure that it would be easy to obtain them without applying dynamics. And now, finally, I arrive to applications. How can one compute volumes experimentally? Not exactly, but to get very good estimates. So I already insisted that it's easy to compute uh, one exactly, to compute contribution of one cylinder surfaces. This is the only simple case. So compute Honestly, what is the absolute contribution of one cylinder surfaces to the volume? And then take any domain, which is convenient for you, and start taking integer points by random and test how many cylinders do they have. This is already experimental part, and you collect statistics. And as soon as you have collected statistics, so you get two quantities, this C1, which is absolute contribution, which is computed exactly and honestly, and which is relatively easy to compute. And you have experimental frequency of appearance of one cylinder surfaces in the most convenient domain you choose. You divide one over the another over another, and since it does not depend on the domain, you should get the volume of the entire space. So I find it somehow cute because we're computing volume of a complicated space, geometry of which is not quite known. And we managed to do it experimentally by Monte Carlo method using any tiny domain which is convenient for experiment. And actually, I should say that uh, in reality, we were not working with the domain because theorems which resemble this, which uh, uh, analogs of this equidistributional theorems are applicable also to interval change transformations. So we're actually working with interval change transformations, which are easier to treat. And this was really important in debugging numerous normalization factors in exact formulas for volumes. And it was quite useful. OK, now I'm trying to recall applications of all these stories. Let's discuss meanders. So meander is this guy. You have, well, there are several versions of meanders, but the most, the usual one is you consider a closed, a simple closed curve in the plane, which intersects a straight line transversely. And they appear in different contexts. According to Landau and Zwonkin, who wrote one of the first survey paper on meanders, uh, the notion itself was introduced by Vladimir Arnold, but the object appears already in the works of Henri Poincaré, and also this object appears in physical literature. It is quite natural combinatorial object, and when you cut your meander by this red line and separate in two pieces, you get two uh, pairs of chord diagrams, which do not self-intersect. Thanks to Etienne for introducing chord diagrams. You've already seen them yesterday. And another convenient notion related to meander is the following. You can consider, so you can, <coughs> consider compactification of your plane with one point to pass from a plane to a sphere. And then these two half planes would become two disks uh, with these arcs transfer which are not self-intersecting, not, not intersecting, and which arrive transversely to their boundary of the disk. So this is really the true chord diagram. We can consider the dual graph then there would be, if there are many chords, there would be many foregoings like this. So the corresponding dual graph would have many vertices of valence two, just forget about them and memorize what is the interesting part of the graph, 
of the tree, and it would be sort of a passport of a meander. It would appear soon. So this is just the description of what you see on the blackboard. I already described it. And now let's do the following. So I want to count meanders, but I want to count meanders not like physicists do, because they count all meanders of uh, with n chords like this all together. I prefer to count them separately for every fixed combinatorics of this graph, or imposing some combinatorial constraints on this graph. So one can do it as follows. It is easy to compute chord diagrams. So we can separately compute the number of chord diagrams on two hemispheres, and then we have some chord diagram on northern hemisphere, chord diagram on southern hemisphere. We glue them together. The trouble is that we not necessarily get a meander. Oh, yeah, and I forgot to tell that also you can twist, of course. So sometimes you get a meander, like here, and sometimes you do not get a meander. You get just a multi-curve. So anticipating the question of Itwa, which he would ask me in a second, uh, let us count what is the frequency, what is the probability to get a meander when you glue two chord diagrams. So we fix the combinatorics of our chord diagrams fixing the trees on the top hemisphere, on the south and northern hemispheres. And then we consider all n arcs on all arc systems with at most n arcs on the top hemisphere of, of fixed combinatorial type on the bottom hemisphere and all possible twists. And we count the number of triples giving rise to meanders and we divide over total number of different triples. And then we let n tend to infinity and we're interested in asymptotic probability to get a meander after, uh, from two arc systems. So I guess that you agree that the probability, well, you have many, many arcs on top, many, many arcs on bottom. You glue them together randomly. The probability to get a single connected curve should be small, right? So probably I have to put a power here, like square or cube. What, what would you suggest? It was a provocation, I apologize. <laughs> Actually, the ratio has a non-zero limit. I, I, sh I should say that it was a provocation but because I didn't expect this myself. It, for me, it was a surprise. I, I did not expect at all that the ratio would be, already the ratio without any powers would be non-zero. And we have a closed formula for any <coughs> pair of graphs, but I, the formula is sort of, long and I suggest to limit ourselves to simpler graphs. So for example, for two graphs which were on the previous picture, the probability is approximately one third, which is surprisingly high to my, to, for, for, to my mind. And the simplest formula appears when instead of fixing the pairs of graphs, you just fix the number of, the total number of leaves. The leaf is there vertex of valence one and the, the end point of the, of, the, of the graph. So if you fix, if you consider all planar trees having the total number P of leaves, then the probability to get a meander from two arc systems is given here on the blackboard. So here is just the answer. And here it is expressed in terms of the quantities which, were, which we discussed before. Here in the denominator, you have volume of the stratum of meromorphic quadratic differentials in genus zero with P minus four simple zeros and P simple poles. And in numerator, you have a contribution to this volume of one cylinder surfaces where I distinguish here, the notation is slightly different. I call it sil because this time I'm considering one cylinder surfaces tiled with a single band of squares. I do not allow several bands, just one band. 
two quantities, all one cylinder surfaces and one cylinder surfaces tiled with only one band are related. So it's almost the same. One is the other multiplied by zeta of dimension. So it's very easy to compute. And the second question is, it was, we computed the probability to get a meander, now, now let's compute the meanders itself. So, and again, I'm not computing, I'm computing meanders imposing extra condition, extra combinatorial restriction, and as a, an extra combinatorial restriction, we can choose the number of these smallest arcs. Uh, they are Meanders appear in literature in various papers, and in some papers they are called pimples. In those, I suggest to compute meanders, to count meanders separately. So this meander is sort of in the general position, and this one is somehow special because it has a maximal R going from right extremity to the left extremity. It's sometimes called rainbow. So both have this five minimal arcs, the one on the left has rainbow, the one here does not. And now I let n, the, number, the total number of arcs, tend to infinity, and the question is what is the asymptotics? And again, what, what is your intuition? Uh, would we have more meanders like this or like that? I would say that naively, here we have an extra condition, right? We have an extra R. There should be less. No. There are more. So even the power of N is different. So this is the answer for meanders which have a maximal arc. You see the power of N is 2 pi minus 4. And here, without maximal arc, the power of N is 2 pi. Uh, minus five, so it's one power less. The answer is given in the second line, and the geometry of the answer is given in the first line, uh, and the geometry of the answer is as follows. So, enumerate, so this is n to appropriate power. This is a dimensional factor. You can see that this is twice the uh, the dimension. This is also a simple-minded combinatorial factor. So the main ingredient is, of course, the numerator. This is the contribution of horizontally and vertically one-cylinder square tile surfaces, where we have a single band of squares horizontally and a single band of squares vertically. Uh, and this is the number, yeah, for, sorry, I didn't s tell that this is for this particular stratum, which is computed in terms of this number of uh, smallest arcs, which are translated into number of zeros and poles. This is again genus zero. And here we have a similar thing, except we consider stratum with a marked point. Uh, now, I have to give an idea of the proof. Uh, oh, if I, yeah, it can change. But, you see, I'm, com I'm computing meanders, so it's sort of a combinatorial object. I'm con computing meanders up to natural equivalence. So the question, how changes the meander when you, so you are suggesting, suggest to rotate the line? Well, this is a separate question. Uh, if you want to add this kind of equivalence, it would be different count. I have no idea straight away how to answer, how to adjust the count. So, but I'm coming back to this simple-minded combinatorial problem. And I want to, I would like to convince you that we basically already solved it. You, you already know the solution in a sense. First, 
the only, well, the most important observation is that pairs of transverse multicurves, like here, so have a blue multicurve and a red multicurve, that's the same as square tile surfaces, which is somehow surprising. You take some abstract sphere, you draw blue multicurve, red multicurve, and then all of a sudden, your sphere takes a shape of, a, of CP1 and also endowed with a mirror-morphic quadratic differential with at most simple poles. The reason is very simple. Just if you take the dual graph to this thing considered as a graph, you get, squared, or you get, you get tiling with foregones. Just declare that your foregones are squares and you get square tiling. That's it. And to, to, to go in the other direction, consider lines which pass, vertical and horizontal lines which pass through centers of the squares. You get pair of transverse multicurves. So it's really bijection. Okay, now let's translate to the language of square tile surface our problem. So pairs of arc systems glued by a common equator, that's the following specialized pair of multicurve. One multicurve is not a multicurve, it's just simple closed curve which comes from the equator, and another is a multicurve. And this we know how to count. This is this contribution, this is square tile surfaces which have single uh, horizontal cylinder. Now, what are the meanders? That's the square tile surfaces where one multicurve is already equated, it's connected, and another multicurve is just a simple closed curve. So in terms of square tile surfaces, it means that we have one horizontal cylinder, one vertical cylinder. So this is this quantity, sil11. And our formula of non-correlation of conditional probability, which is the same as usual probability, tells that this quantity is expressed in terms of this one by this formula. So in genus zero, computation of volume is easy. I presented an explicit formula. And I tried, I didn't prove this, but I tried to convince you that it is easy to compute contribution of one cylinder surfaces. And we get the answer. And that, this is the formulas. Okay, now I hope that I frightened you enough with explaining that computation of volume is painful and that, for example, for genus 10, it takes days of computer of CPU time to compute volumes. But the nice thing is that when genus becomes large, everything simplifies. Not exactly, but asymptotically. So here's the formula for the volume of the stratum when genus is sufficiently large. And I'm happy to announce the theorem. It is no more a conjecture. Since several days, it's a theorem. I got a permission by email from Martin Muller to announce it. I'm a little bit ashamed to announce a theorem on which they were working for, I don't know, seven or eight years before the authors, but it was too tempting, especially at this conference. So I tried to prepare some things which were never announced for the conference in the memory of Jean Christophe. So there is a nice uh, asymptotics for the volume. What about contribution of one cylinder surfaces, two cylinder surfaces, and so on? So as I repeated many times, it's easy to work with one cylinder surfaces. So there is this universal estimate with, with two inequalities are sharp for contribution of one cylinder surfaces. And you recognize here formula for the volume. Now, zeta of d, when d is large, is equal to one to for everybody except number theorists. Uh, and, and denominator is very close to D, meaning that contribution of one cylinder square tile surfaces is approximately one over the dimension of the stratum, and it does not depend on the stratum. Unfortunately, yeah, and by the way, this is a challenge to use this formula to try to prove volume asymptotics independently of a quite sophisticated machinery of 
quasi-model machinery of Chen, Müller, and Zegir. Now, what about contributions of other, of two-cylinder surfaces and so on? So what, what, what is their distribution of contributions? So, for example, for the principal stratum in genus 100, you might have uh, any number of cylinders between 1 and 3g minus 3, so between 1 and 297. Uh, what distribution should one expect, whether it's sort of uniform or normal? Or... For us, it was completely unexpected. It is not quite normal, and what, is, what was the most... Well, there were plenty of striking things, and right now I'm speaking about experimental facts, and probably I will turn on all the conjectures. So you see we can have up to approximately 300 cylinders. You never see more than 15. It is sort of the opposite of what we learned from Morse theory. In Morse theory, the singular points are supposed to be at different levels, right? There is no chance that two, two points get to the same level. No, no, here they really like to stay on Many, many zeros want to stay at the same level. Uh, so the maximum of this distribution is approximately logarithm of dimension of the stratum. Another striking thing is that if you take two strata which have different genera but exactly the same dimension, and you compare these two graphs, they're indistinguishable. So it seems that there is some universal, well, up to, after normalization, we, we hope that after normalizing first and the second moment, you get some universal distribution, and it's a challenging question, what is the distribution? I'm not sure that it's symmetric. So to, for comparison, the red one is the Gaussian distribution. I'm not sure that in the limit, if this asymptotic distribution really exists, that it would become symmetric, it might re remain skewed, and if it is skewed, it is very interesting to learn whether it's something like tracy widen distribution, whether it satisfies some interesting equations and so on. Okay, and now I prepared um, another thing which was never announced, so I have the série sur le gâteau, and let me come back to something which should be considered as classical. Forget about model, temporarily, about model A spaces of abelian and quadratic differentials, just consider their usual model A space of curves with N markings. Uh, then having, so this is the model A space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with N marked points. I consider partitions of this number 3g minus 3 plus n into sum of integer numbers, and I consider the following polynomials. These polynomials in up to now formal variables b1, etc., bn squared, n is the number of markings, and they're constructed as follows. You take a multi, so this b power 2d is product like this, and the coefficient, which depends on multi-index d, is given here. So this is just combinatorial constant, product of factorials. And here it's the integral over mgn of this product of psi classes. So I should say that uh, I, st yeah, I still have some time, so I can remind that this is a celebrity. So in for mathematicians, this is an intersection number. For physicists, it, it's a correlator, and it's celebrity since Witten's conjecture. So I will use one minute to remind their notation. So this is the model I space of Riemann surfaces with n marked points. Choose marked point number three, for example, and consider tangent or better cotangent uh, plane to this Riemann surface at this marked point. Well, if you consider this Riemann surface as a complex curve, it's not a plane, it's a line. So <coughs> memorize this line, and now when you deform your Riemann surface with a marked point, 
you get a family of lines. So our mod line space, MGN, is endowed with N very special line bundles. And you can consider the first churn class of first line bundle and call it Psi 1, first churn class, well, the churn class of all the other ones and call their churn class of their nth line bundle by Psi n. And then, well, you have elements of the second cohomology. You know that you can multiply elements of cohomology and you multiply, you arrange to multiply them in such a way that the corresponding degree would be exactly the dimension of the space. And then you have, you have if, well, a differential form of, of top degree, you can integrate it over the compact manifold, you get a number, a characteristic number. And it's celebrity because, uh, well, for physicists, it's, if you, as usual, when you have zillions of numbers like this, the very reasonable thing is to wrap them into a generating function, and for physicists, this generating function uh, is related to two-dimensional quantum gravity, and Witten conjectured that these numbers satisfy some recurrent relations, uh, which can be transformed into, which can be encoded by KDV equation. And then Witten's conjecture was proved by Kontsevich, and then there were further proofs by Okunkov and Pandaripanda, and by Maria Mirzahani. And in the proof of Maria Mirzahani, so you see, I, I told that this guy is celebrity because it is ingredient of, for example, four fields medals. And uh, in the works of Maria Mirzahani, this polynomial, well, up to a factor of two. This is actually the Weil Peterson volume of bordered, of the moduli space of bordered Riemann surfaces. Instead of considering Riemann surfaces with n punctures, you consider Riemann surfaces with n boundary components. And you demand these boundary components to be hyperbolic geodesics. And B1, et cetera, Bn are length of this hyperbolic geodesic. So this polynomial is, uh, sorry, this polynomial is sort of top homogeneous part, well, up to this scaling by two, of this volume polynomial of Mirzahani. And now let me introduce a formal operator on polynomials. When you have a monomial in Bs, I construct a number where for each term b power m, I take m factorial and then multiply by zeta function shifted at, at m shifted by one. So now I want to play the formal, form, formal game. Consider, for example, surface of genus two. Here in the picture, you see all possible topological decompositions of the surface of genus two using uh, simple curves. I'm, you can guess what is the definition of the decomposition from the picture. So I do not distinguish decompositions uh, which can be related by a homeomorphism and I forbid to simple curves to be homotopic. And then as soon as I have a decomposition, I associate to this decomposition the following polynomial. So here, for example, we decompose, yeah, and I forgot to say that I assign to every curve which is involved in the decomposition letter B1, B2, etc., in numbering the curves. So here we have only one cut by B1. When we open up the surface, we get a surface of genus one with two boundary components. So I use polynomial which corresponds to genus one with two boundary components and I put arguments B1, B1 as arguments. These are combinatorial factors. So in red, this is as usual one over the order of automorphism group and in blue, 
it is one over two power number of connected components minus one. So here we have only one connected component, so we get one. Here we get two connected components, we get two. So and so on. So was it I hope that the formal game is clear. So to every decomposition, I associate uh, the corresponding product of my polynomials. And I forgot to say, I also multiply by the product of all Bs. Then I apply my operator, which transforms <coughs> polynomials. Sorry, I do not. So this is just the values of these polynomials. This, I replace this ends, et cetera, by the true values, I already mentioned that this uh, intersection numbers satisfy recurrence relations, so they can be computed. These polynomials are computable. OK, and now the theorem. And I can tell why I'm so happy with this theorem. For approximately two decades, we dreamed of a bridge which would join, finally, the hyperbolic world with flat word. And as you mentioned, up to now, I was using only the objects of Maria Mirzahani from the hyperbolic world. Now, here's the formula for the volume, for the Mazurvich volume of the moduli space of quadratic differentials, holomorphic quadratic differentials in genus G. You have this combinatorial factor, and then you sum over all possible decompositions of surfaces where you associate to every decomposition this polynomial as in the previous slide, and then you apply this operator which transforms this to, to a number. Now, here's a sort of philosophical remark. Uh, to compute the Weil-Peterson volume of MGM, Mariam takes these volume polynomials and then shrinks all the boundary components to get just cusps. So she replaces all these Bs by zeros, meaning that the weil peterson volume, is, well, it uses the constant term of the volume polynomial. We, were, we use the volume polynomial in exactly opposite regime. So we are interested in the coefficients of top homogeneous part of this polynomial, meaning that we make the length of this boundary components tend to infinity, and we're interested in asymptotics of how do they tend to infinity. We collect the corresponding coefficients, then we wrap them in this formula, and we get the volume for their, uh, the Mazur-Rich volume. And so here's a concrete computation for genus 2. You have already seen the polynomials which appear in this left column. Then I apply operator z, so I am keeping this coefficient. And then b power 5 is transformed to the following thing. So I take power 5 and replace it by 5, five factorial. And then I shift pow power 5 by 1 and get, I get z of 6, uh, and so on. And then you take the sum over all these contributions, and you get the measure of each volume in genus 2. Well, as before, if I increase the genus, it becomes a nightmare. And it becomes a nightmare by two reasons. First, it's a nightmare combinatorial, because there are zillions of decompositions, and you have to, to take a sum over zillions of graphs with taking care of one over order of automorphism group. And also, it's for large genera, it's not so easy to compute these correlators. So I suggest to take now to confine ourselves to simplest possible decompositions. So we're working with surfaces of genus G. What is the surface of genus G? It's a sphere with G handles. So just Take any number k between 1 and g and chop k out of g handles. So here for genus 2, you can chop one handle or both handles. So I am considering only those de decompositions such that after cutting over the curves, I still get a connected surface. And now we have only g of them. The the, well, this is the last slide, and this is a conjecture. This is not a theorem. 
As before, I'm interested in, well, plenty of things. First, we conjecture that basically all the volume sits on this G simplest graphs. That if you compute the contribution of only these G graphs and divide by volume of the, by the entire volume, then when genus grows, it, you get one as a limit. So this is a conjectural formula for the volume in large genus asymptotics. And this is a picture which is analogous to, uh, to the one which I showed for abelian differentials. So in red is the contribution of these G particular graphs. The, so I forgot to say that this is genus nine. In blue, this is contribution of pillow cakes covers of any number of cylinders. And uh, as you see, the two graphs match very, very well. And also, as you see, you really do not see many cylinders. It's sort of the same kind of graph. Not exactly, because at least this point, which is testable, is conjecturally not one over g, but one over square root of g. But still, morally, there are many similar properties in particular. So part of the conjecture is that this graph rapidly decreases very fast. So there, you do not see many cylinders. So basically, in this sum, you even don't need to compute the sum from k to g. You probably need to compute the sum from k to, I don't know, two or three logs of g, and you are done. You already know very good approximation for the volume. So to finish, just, sorry, I'm just last two sentences. One sentence is that this is a work in collaboration with uh, Vincent de la Croix, who is somewhere in the audience, I don't, yes, who is there, with Elise Goujard, I'm not sure, she's probably teaching today. Uh, she was at the conference, and with Peter Zograf, who is from St. Petersburg, and this is one thing. And another thing is that I should say that large part of what I told today was inspired by works of Maria Mirzahani. In particular, the proof of this equidistribution result, we were looking for it for years, and then reading papers of Mariam, we realized that in a different context, she applies a very simple argument can be transformed just by several lines and gives the proof. And of course, this last part with volumes is strongly inspired by the beautiful works of Mariam. Thank you very much. <laughs>